Hello, this is uh, lecture 8, so dealing with the neutral axis, second moment of area, parallel axis theorem and the engineer's bending equations. Okay, so far we've looked at the beam from the side. Yes, where we've uh, imagined we've got a beam we put it in some pivots and we've loaded it. That load is going to cause us some bending. And that bending is going to cause some stress. In this case, it will cause tensile stress appearing at the bottom and compressive stress at the top. So what this uh, lecture is all about is trying to get to the point of working out what is that maximum stress being caused by that loading um, uh, what's the maximum tensile stress and what's the maximum compressive stress to do that we need to consider the beam in a more whole manner so we need to also consider therefore what is the beam actually constructed by typically beams will be constructed by i beams so they'll be made by this kind of um, construction and the reason for this is because this gives us a large second moment of area which relates to how stiff the beam becomes So today we'll look at second moment uh, neutral axis, the second moment of area term, parallel axis theorem, and the engineer's bending equations. Neutral axis is required for a couple of things. Second moment of area is this term I've talked about in terms of making how measuring how stiff the beam is going to be. Parallel axis theorem is something that's required as part of calculations to do with second moment of area. And the engineering bending equations is where we're going to get how much bending stress we're going to get from the loading of the beam. Okay, so we start off with uh, what we're, we're looking for, as I said, is essentially speaking, we're looking for the bending stress in the beam. And that occurs at the maximum moment that's why we were doing the bending moment diagrams so so we're looking for the maximum bending moment on those diagrams and it's going to be dependent upon the kind of beam that you're bending so that's uh, incorporated mainly in the second moment of area of the beam <coughs> and the stress calculations can be done by these things called the engineers bending equations start off with the neutral axis so this is the centroid. You've already calculated what the neutral axis is. It turns out that the neutral axis and the centroid are one and the same thing. Okay, so the neutral axis is required for two things. It's required for helping us do calculations for the second moment of area, but later on it's also required to find where the maximum bending stress in the beam is going to be. So we'll have a look at that later. If we consider just an isometric I-beam, then this there wouldn't be a great problem here. The neutral axis would be bang in the middle there. And I would imagine that if I put a load on top, that the top part of the beam would kind of compress inwards, go compress inwards, and the bottom would be pulled outwards. So we'd have an inward compression and an outward uh, being pulled apart tension um, and uh, everything would be straightforward because we would assume that therefore in between that compression at the top and the tension at the bottom halfway up in the beam there's going to be <coughs> the centroid where there's going to be no stress so to find the centroid, um, we use this formula here, 
which is a little bit like a moments formula. So you can rearrange this. So you've got the total area times by the centroid of the of this arrangement. So this, so this I arrangement, what I do is I'll split it up into rectangles. And then I'll say that if I sum up the area times the centroid of each rectangle, did I say triangles? I meant rectangles. So we've got the, we know the centroids of each one of these times it by its particular area for the rectangle, sum them up. Uh, that is going to be the equivalent of, if I have the same amount of uh, area um, by some sort of uh, Y location. And what you're doing there is a, is basically a kind of um, moment equation. <coughs> now you've done this before. Okay, so you've uh, in your first week you found centroids and you use this equation. But what we want to do is use the approach that they use in the course notes uh, because it helps us a lot for when you want to go on to then do calculations for a second moment of area for an I beam. And it's either going to be an I beam or a T beam that we're interested in possibly a channel beam. So a channel beam basically looks like a C. Um, so these these are the kind of sort of like beams that you can imagine. They're, they're fairly sort of rectangular in shape. So what I do to apply this formula is I, uh, as I said, I split my rectangles into convenient shapes so the most convenient way to do it is to like make um, horizontal lines across these intersections I've got an area one area two area three you might want to label them that way around it doesn't matter so we might want to do them that way and then for each area multiply it by its centroid so we need to find its centroid by looking at the middle and then measuring it from some pivot, some reference point, and we always take that to be the base of our beam. So, so it's the distance from the base to that centroid location for that one. For this one, it's going to be this distance, and for this one, it's going to be this distance. So, as you can see, as we go up, so the first one, first rectangle, it's just going to be half d1. We use d1 to represent depth because we're imagining we're putting load on top. So we're measuring the depth of our, our beam as we're, as we're loading up from, from above. So the first one, we're taking this to be our reference location, y equals 0. And the what's the depth of this particular rectangle section? Well, it's D1, so I'll take half D1 and then I'll be at the centroid for that particular uh, rectangle in reference to this. Imagine this to be my pivot position. For D2, then I need to take the height of D1 and then take half the depth length for this rectangle section. And so that's going to give me that centroid location, Y2 there, will be there. And then for the top one, remember to add the depth, or the height if you prefer, of this rectangle, this rectangle, so that's my D1 and my D2 added together. And then we add on half the height for the top section, so that's going to be 0.5 D3. Now, you could just use this um, this formula here if you've got an I-type beam, but what we want to do is use more of a tabulated way of um, writing out our numbers, because this helps us then when we go on to find the second moment of area for the cross-section of the beam. So what we do is we'll call this the breadth and this the depth. Okay, or the height if you prefer. 
I avoid the word height because I'm going to use h for some other term later on. So breadth and depth of each rectangle section. B times D is obviously going to be the area of the rectangle section. Um, and uh, um, we're going to fill up a table a little bit that looks like this. So here I'm doing this kind of I-beam here. So it's an asymmetric I-beam. You can see that we've got a section here which is apparently 150 millimeters wide. And it's got a depth of 10 millimeters. When you're working in millimeters and you've got this, uh, these sort of numbers, the best scenario, really, best case is to is to work in millimeters because you you're um, you normally get kind of horrible numbers in your calculators if you don't. You could convert to meters if you prefer. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just uh, nice to work in whole numbers. So we take the breadth and the depth um, times it by the depth and then you find the area then we make a note of where's the centroid for that one so that's going to be at five millimeters and then I find what's called the first moment of area so that's the a times the y times them together and then I'm going to get these results here and it's the sum of the first area of moments divided by the, s the sum of the areas that gives me the centroid location for everything. So you can see you're going to get the same thing for the next section. It's 10 meters wide, uh, 10, 10 millimeters wide, 150 meter, uh, millimeters in depth. I'm going to get this same number for area. So this section here and this section here has just been sort of rotated 90 degrees. The y, yeah, let's be careful here. So you measure this depth here, 10, and then you add on half of this depth here. So uh, the um, half of uh, 150 is going to be 75. 75 plus 10 gives me 85. And then I've got this number and this number, multiply them together, and then I'm going to get that number. So then we do the same thing for the top section, 60, 60 millimeters wide, 10 millimeters in depth. Uh, find the area, find this its centroid. Have to be very careful here because you're adding up two depths and then add in a half a depth for the top section. And we find that to be 165. Multiply A and Y together, get those two terms. Then I sum up all my areas and then I put them into this box and I sum up all my first area of moments and put them into this box. And then I put and then I take that number and then divide it by this number. Dimensionally I know which way around to go because I'm looking at AY divided by A's is gonna leave me with a Y term. We're looking for a Y term. So we end up with 65 millimeters. Good p f point here is now to then put a rough sketch in terms of your diagram where you think that neutral axis occurs. So this is uh, 10. So it's going to be, um, I was thinking, let's have a look at what's the overall height of this thing. So the overall height is going to be uh, 170. So 170, divide that by 2 is um, 85 so if we were going halfway in the beam we could imagine where halfway would be which looks pretty much around here to be honest that then tells us that uh, the neutral axis I would say is probably a better estimate would be a bit be a bit further down around 65 millimeters and that seems about kind of correct sort of like it's going to be based more towards the lower base So why am I interested in this neutral axis thing? Well, imagine I had a coal, uh, gold bar here, upside down, or we we'll put loading at the weight. So our neutral axis is slightly going to be going towards the uh, the lower section here because this is a wider base, and we've just seen that if you have a wider base with the previous I beam, <coughs> the neutral axis will tend to move slightly towards that uh, that direction from the halfway position. So this neutral axis, um, what I can do now is imagine that I'm going to put a load 
on from the top of the beam what will happen is that I should therefore get that um, the slower part is slightly elongated because it's going to be causing a bending effect okay so that's going to get elongated get pulled apart and the top section was slightly you know concave in and get shortened um so the um the neutral axis will be a point in between these two uh, um, points so in between where it's getting pulled apart extended elongated well on the lower section and where it's getting shortened on the upper section and the neutral axis will be somewhere in between the two where the distance as it gets Put moved gets moved in, but uh, but this one gets moved out, and this top one gets moved in. Um, so the neutral axis turns out to be at the same location of the centroid. So that's sounds like yeah, um, I'm probably want to know where that that is. Um, I know that uh, the lower part is going to be in tension, and I know that the upper part is going to be in compression. So the neutral axis is very interesting point of reference for one thing is going to be at the point of reference where we've got no change in elongation when I apply the load okay so this comes back to what you see in the course notes and this diagram here can take you a long way through the differentiation of the engineers bending equations so um, it's um, we won't go through the differentiation at the moment, but it it involves basically um, if you want to try to solve it yourself, you're going to look at the path difference in terms of the radius. So we're using big R here, so we, I'm imagining that I'm applying a weight and that this is going to cause a kind of radius of curvature. So I'm using a big R and uh, the path length here what I do is I imagine that when I take the load off it's going to have the same path length at this point here the C point gets slightly moved inwards to, to the C dash location when, uh, when we apply the load the D um, goes to the D dash location so that gets slightly moved inwards and the A goes to a location slightly outwards and the B goes to a location slightly outwards. The neutral axis I define as my reference point. I have Y pointing away from where the uh, uh, where we're getting the bend in there. Well actually we we'll have Y pointing downwards actually as um, as our reference system. So um, when Y equals zero we're at a location where we're getting no elongation or no shortening of the beam when y is because we've applied decided to apply the load from above when y is at the bottom we're going to get the maximum amount of uh, elongation and when y equals this negative number here so we're going we're imagining y to be a vector so when y goes to the top of the beam there we're going to get the maximum amount of shortening in the beam so the derivation, the first part of the derivation of second of the engineer's equation, involves using this term here, and it involves using Young's modulus. Sorry, stress over strain. So basically, just these two equations, uh, uh, you slightly rearrange them, and you compare the original length to uh, the length in this from this section to this section and you can work out the first part of the engineer's bending equation we won't do that in this particular lecture now let's move on to the second moment of area so the second moment of area so this is given the symbol i in terms of um, it, it's a term that appears in the engineer's bending equations it's usually measured in units of either where well, we're working in millimeters, millimeters to the power of four, or meters to the power of four, and it's a measure of how stiff the beam is going to be. So uh, it's also a measure of how the area has been distributed 
um, uh, in terms of how far it is away from the neutral axis. So a higher I represents that I've distributed my area so that it's um, uh, quite far away from the neutral axis location. So an I beam, is, uh, we can imagine, will have a large I compared to the same amount of area if we had a square beam. Okay. So if I had an I beam, and then I imagine we've got the same amount of area, so this area here equals this area here, okay, but because I've distributed more area away from the neutral axis, it turns out that this beam here will have an a higher I value. So that means it's a stiffer beam. Okay, the va the equation that we can use for a rectangle section to find its second moment of area is that if I imagine that I'm going to bend this beam about the neutral axis, which is going to be a bang in the middle, I can use this formula here. So well, this formula is <coughs> B, the breadth, times the depth of the beam. And that makes sense, okay? So if I'm if I, this is my beam here, uh, my breadth is this way and my depth is this way. If I try and load this beam from above, we can imagine that this, uh, this calculator is going to bend quite easily. Now if we uh, decide to load the beam from above such that the breadth is now going to be on the bottom here, and this is my depth here, you can imagine, if I try to load this beam now, it's going to be really diff really stiff to bend compared to this beam. Load it, that's going to be bendable. So you can see that that's why if you're going to load a beam, you would want to load it so that the the D is the or rather the longer length is going to be in line with um, with the load as it's coming coming down. Um, so if I had imagined this was a bit of timber, a one centimeter against two centimeters, the I value uh, uh, for um, my beam, if I have it this uh, this way arranged compared to this this way arranged. Well, what's the uh, the I values that I'm going to get there? So if I have the beam uh, laid flat, so I flat is going to be two times d one to the power three over twelve. So we've got two over twelves, and then if we have I, so this is my flat arrangement, um, or top side I suppose. So if we have this uh, top arrangement, we've now got B is 1 times by D, which is going to be 2 to the power of 3 over 12. So we've got 8 twelfths. So you can see that the ratio of the stiffness for this arrangement is 4 times stiffer than, than this arrangement. So this is the way we want to arrange our, our beams. Now this formula, which I haven't gone into details of how we've uh, managed to achieve it, but this formula, second moment of area for a rectangle beam, only works if we imagine that the beams getting um, bent around this location here, this uh, through its neutral axis. So what happens if we don't bend the beam around its neutral axis, which is what's going to happen with when we try to work out what the um, second moment of area for an I-beam is. Because I've got a formula so I can apply here, B to the times D to the power of 3 for the, uh, divided by 12 for the lower section. 
So I've got this formula and I can use this formula for different dimensions for the various sections. But there's only one section, assuming this is a symmetric beam, there's only one section where I can use this formula because there's only this section here where it's going through its neutral axis. So this section and this section have to do something slightly different. Well, it turns out that I can use this formula for all three sections, but for the sections which are being bent where their local neutral axis, if you like, th um, is displaced away from the actual neutral axis for the girder, um, I ha then have to add on um, the parallel axis theorem. And you can see this is where a lot of the stiffness comes from, from an I-beam design. So the neutral parallel axis theorem is basically what we have to do is take the formula that we would use, imagine that we're bending it around its neutral axis, plus the area times by h squared, where h is the distance away from the neutral axis to the new location where um, uh, where the centroids ended up. So this is where my centroid is. Okay, so I need to take that location of the centroid and then measure the distance back to wherever the beam is being bent around. So let's say it's uh, this location here. So that's what H is. So H you could write as the distance where it is, so we'll call that say Y, take away where the neutral axis is for the actual girder. So the Y2 for, um, again, if we imagine this to be a nice symmetric beam, y, uh, the Y2 will be um, the same as the uh, the neutral where the neutral axis is for the beam is so that's so for the girder sorry so that is going to be where the the centroid is located bang in the middle assuming this is to be spectric so to find the second moment of area for this i beam i add up all the second mom uh, moment of area formulas for the various sections here and then i add on what's called the parallel axis theorem components. This, the one in the middle, because it's being bent, we're assuming this is metric, the distance from uh, the centroid for the middle section and the location for the um, the neutral axis is uh, the distance is going to be zero. They're located at the same point, so the h2 value, the distance for well that that particular section, is going to be zero. Well, we expected that to be the case anyway because we said that uh, this formula here works for when you bend it around its um, uh, centroid location, and we've located the middle the middle rectangle such that it gets bent around its uh, centroid location. So the terms that we need to add on will be for the lower section here and then for the upper section and again assuming this all to be symmetric it would uh, it's obvious that uh, these these two terms are going to be equal to one another. So our neutral, um, the second moment of area for the entire system, for the entire girder, will be the second moment of area for each rectangle sections, plus adding on these parallel access theorem components. So let's come back to um, looking at a problem now where we uh, found the neutral axis for this, in this case, a channel beam. And we're going to take it from stage one. So stage one is where we're going to find the neutral axis. So I fill in my B column here 
my breadth column, my depth column, I find my areas, um, I find my distances, the, the centroids for each particular rectangle section, I, and I take A times Y and fill in this column. Then I sum up all my AY values, and then I sum up all my A values. I divide this by this, and then that will give me where the uh, the um, um, neutral axis is, which I'm going to call Y bar in this case. Once I've got the the Y bar, so we've uh, we've uh, worked out what that term is, we can then use the Y bar value and go back to the Y values and take the Y bar value away from the Y values and then fill in these columns here. If we get a negative value, which we would for um, for one and three. So these would actually be, be minus values. We just ignore the negative and then say it's a positive. So that then helps us find what the H is. So now when we've got the H we want to square it and then multiply it by the A. And then finally we, we can then fill in these this column here using the formula B D to the power of 3 divided by 12. And what I need to do is look back at these two columns to get those values. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Right. So that leads to uh, filling up this column with the second moment of area terms, um, sorry, the parallel axis theorem terms, and this column filling them up with the second moment of area formula terms. And it turns out that the second moment of area for this girder is going to be the sum of everything. We need to add them all together. So the engineer's bending equations. So this is a classic equation. I've talked about how you'd go about deriving the first part of that. which requires this equa um, this uh, uh, this diagram. Um, how you go through the full duration of that won't cover at this point. Do a separate video for that. But the engineer's bending equation is um, a rather interesting equation because it involves two equal signs and normally you're told never ever to use two equal signs in one line. So we have the bending moment m value which is what comes from the bending moment um, a graph that you find divided by the second moment of area which is what all we did all those sort of tables for and we can then find this very important term which is the bending stress that's that's in the beam. The bending stress is dependent upon how far y is going to be away from the neutral axis. Okay. So because this is the most important part of the engineer's bending formula normally these two, this column on the end kind of gets ignored. Um, the bit on the first two columns is usually rearranged because we're interested in finding out what the stress is normally in the beam. We know how it's being loaded. Uh, we know the distance from the neutral axis to the lower part of the beam and the distance from uh, the neutral axis to the upper part of the beam. And we know um, the second moment of area. So, if we had uh, a problem like this, where what we're going to be plugging into M is typically going to be uh, when we've loaded up the beam, we're going to find what the either the maximum um, M value is, or the, rather the absolute maximum value, which could be a positive, could be a negative. We're probably going to be interested in, in these points. So, 
if you had a beam which uh, gave you a bending moment diagram, I don't know, so let's say of this, I would have to examine both this value here, m, and the negative m, and see uh, what kind of um, characteristics I get there. So I'm trying to find what the maximum stress is, and the the uh, th that means that you need to therefore look at usually if you've got them both the maximum positive m and the maximum negative m and they get then will get plugged into these formula and we would therefore find the stress values top and bottom of the beam the i is found from using the parallel axis theorem from using the formula for rectangle sections and uh, usually using that sort of table approach the other thing that we might want to bend is rods so rods um, have this formula here second moment of area for a rod is pi d to the power 4 divided by 64 y as I mentioned before is the distance from the neutral axis and it's the distance going and uh, I will use the convention that it's the distance pointing downwards so it's the distance pointing downwards from there and I would measure this distance and then measure this distance negative values because um, although I will be getting um, obviously uh, you can see the stress is dependent upon y so you might say to yourself well why am I uh, why am I looking uh, both up and uh, down and below I can see that y going from the neutral axis to the bottom is going to be the larger y well the reason is is because uh, we need to come back and look at our beam from the side So if we had a beam like this with a big base, uh, halfway up would be, let's say, here. This might have a neutral axis down at this point here. So the um, distance that's going to cause the greatest uh, shear will be this distance from here to here. So that kind of gives you an indication that um, why depends on whether it's going through um, you know, let's say I was looking for uh, how much tensile stress was at the bottom how much tensile stress was in the beam so if I loaded it from above it would sag in this direction and I'd be interested in this measuring this distance if I was interested in looking at the maximum tensile stress in the, in the uh, entire beam I might want to look at a location where it's hogs, where the beam might hog. So I, if I applied a load here and a load here, this would cause hogging around the left pivot. And so uh, the beam will be in tension at the top. Here it's sagging the beam will be in tension at the bottom okay uh, last two terms we hardly ever use so the first one is the Young's modulus and the R you've already seen from that diagram it says the radius of curvature where we imagine that the deflection is such that we could basically Imagining, imagine that we could have pass a circle that would fit uh, around that curved line. Okay, let's have a look at uh, an example. So imagine we got a twenty-four, no, serious eighteenth-month-old child walking across a beam made out of marshmallow the beam is 24 meters long and the child's going to weigh about 100 newtons
So I can draw up very quickly a shear force diagram and therefore follow on with a bending moment diagram and I work out the maximum bending moment is going to be a uh, maximum bending moment value is going to be given by 600 Newton meters. The cross section of the beam in this case is a, it's a T beam. 3 meters wide and a 1 meter depth. So I can work out now what the neutral axis is going to be by labeling up my my lower beam as 1 and my upper beam as 2. So that's my lower beam and then my upper beam. Lower beam has a width of 1 times my depth of 3. The beam 2 has a width of uh, 3 and a depth of 1. Find the areas find the centroids for these particular rectangles and then find the first moment of areas. So that tells me that the centroid for this T-beam is a nice location, it's two and a half. Okay, so now we know where the y bar value is, which is two and a half. We can look back at our y values, take them away from the two and a half values, ignore them if we get negative answers. <coughs> and in this case, we end up with values of one and one. And then we find that a, the a times h squared terms, so they end up being three, that's straightforward. And we find the b d to the power of three divided by 12 terms. So the second moment of area for the beam is going to be everything added up in this column, everything added up in this column. And the results I get out, it turns out that uh, Marshmallow has a, um, a yield strength, I think, of 13 kilopascals. So the Marshmallow is not going to crack, although it's not particularly great uh, loading. Uh, and the radius curvature is works out to be 425 meters. Okay, so that's um, a five degree curve could fit my result. You can see that this is my 24 meters apart, and this is the curvature that we would expect. So certainly in terms of that curvature and deformation doesn't look significant. Right, so what are we uh, doing then in order to derive this formula for the second moment of area? We're making some conditions, it's worth pointing out. So first of all, we're assuming that uh, we've initially got a nice straight beam so and there's no weights or loading in there and that <coughs> all the material that we use is homogeneous the layers elastic properties we never go beyond the yield strength the elastic limit when we're doing our uh, differentiation uh, young's modulus for the material is going to we're going to assume uh, is the same in both tension and compression so that's slight limitation probably limits us really to metals on the whole Plane cross sections remain plane before and after bending. That's a tricky one because that means that, um, uh, um, well, uh, um, that obviously would not be a case um, that would be true in real life. Every cross section of the beam is symmetrical about the plane of the bending, about the an access to the uh, neutral axis. Okay, um, uh, that's an axis perpendicular to the neutral axis. So we're assuming that um, <coughs> this is my beam here. I'm applying the load from above. I'm assuming that I can always make a mirror image as I turn it around in that direction. And again, that there is no result on force perpendicular to any cross-sectional areas. For the second moment of area, 
we can imagine this to be an uh, sort of had an analogy, an analogy with uh, the moment of mass, and indeed there's a lot of confusion there. So uh, the uh, in terms of um, inertia, um, we have the formula I equals let's say for I don't know a mass on the end of a string. So we have this formula m r squared. And so notice, let's say, for the parallel access theorem, we had the the term a h squared. So we seem to be getting some kind of basic properties there. So I, um, m here in terms of um, inertia, which you look at in terms of dynamics, and here in statics in terms of a. And both of these terms are pretty kind of almost interchangeable in the sense that they're, they're obviously both going to be some sort of lengths that we're dealing with and we're squaring them. The term moment is usually associated with forces and distances, uh, so that's why the second moment of area is um, called as it is because it's um, uh, the first moment moment of area, if you like, is y integrated with respect to area and the second one is y squared integrated with respect to area so for calculating them we will typically be dealing with these kind of problems a t-beam, a regular i-beam or an unsymmetric i-beam so that's this one here we split the sections up into rectangles. We'll take our reference point to be the point at the bottom, y equals zero, and we assume that, um, that the centroid is um, a distance that lies somewhere on that y-axis. So this is me filling in a chart without numbers this time. So. I've got my B1 times my D1, found my area, and then I've got my Y1. Okay, oh sorry, I've, I've, um, I've uh, labeled the wrong way around here, so it's, this is um, free. So I've got my B3, my D3, um, B, D, B3 times D3. And then we're going to measure this d3 value here. Multiply these two terms together. And then we find the neutral axis. For the second moment of area, we need to have found the neutral axis so we can uh, find this, um, uh, this uh, column here, which is going to be h which is the distance of the particular um, center points for the each rectangle take away the neutral axis. So then we can find the areas times by h, by the um, h value squared. And then we can use our formula to find the second moment of area for a rectangle. So these are the steps you need to go through for calculating the second moment of area. You need to split them up into sections, you draw a reference line at the bottom, you draw up a table to calculate um, in order so that you want to be calculating the sum of the areas and the sum of first moment of, of areas because then we use sum of first moment of areas divided by areas will give us where the centroid location is and then uh, you can go on and draw columns on the table to find what the h is going to be, a h squared, and what the i value is going to be. From that table you can then go on to find what the second moment of area term is. So when we bring it all together, um, we we'll do this in tutorials, we can calculate the uh, shear force diagram, the bending moment diagram, 
we can calculate the segment of area um, for a relatively complex beam, provided it's sort of like squares. It would be broken up into rectangles, sorry. We can determine the neutral axis or the centroid for that particular sort of design. And we, we can then go and calculate the stresses that we would expect to appear in the beam at any location. Okay. So there's an example of bringing it all together here where we've got an unsymmetric I beam. It's been loaded with this 80 and 40 concentrated loads, a UDL in the middle. To jog the uh, divination along, we're told where the neutral axis is, so that's my Y bar. And we're told what the second moment of area is. So we'd want to work out what the shear graph looks like, and then we draw a bending moment diagram. This one's a bit tricky because it's giving us um, a maximum bending moment uh, here, and then it's going to give us the maximum negative at this point. So I kind of almost drew that as hogging, I should have done. So that's uh, going to be the hogging one, and this will be the sagging one. So I need to actually look at both of these numbers because of the facts that I don't have a symmetric beam. If I did have a symmetric beam, then all I would need to do would be to go and look at uh, uh, the stresses occurring at the maximum bending moment stress. So if I've got a positive um, M value, this will therefore lead to something that's going to be um, a sagging scenario. If I've got a negative bending moment diagram, then it leads to a sagging kind of scenario. So for the maximum positive, uh, if we imagine that we've got a maximum positive bending moment value, let's say of 105 kilonewton meters, the top edge is going to be in compression, the bottom edge is going to be in tension, and we say that this beam is sagging. So to work out what uh, the stress values are going to be, I then need to go back to find where Y bar is, measure this distance and measure this distance uh, and those that gives me if you like a y top value so from this is going to be from the right top of the girder to the neutral axis and here we're going to take from the neutral axis take away from zero so this one is a little bit more involved than typical whoops what am I doing h H equals Y bar take away Y. So going back to that graph where we had the maximum M value, I don't know if you recall, but it was 105 kilonewton meters. So that's my M value going in. Uh, so my first thing I'm going to do is look at what the compressive stress is. So I think we had something like that, didn't we? Um, so the compressive stress will be from the, the neutral axis to this distance here. So that would be the compressive stress. We were actually told, I think, originally just to find the maximum tensile stress. Or no, both stresses, sorry. I'll take that back. So now let's look at the, the tensile stress, and what's that going to be? Well, we're doing a positive uh, bending moment value, which means we're getting loading from the top. So we're certainly trying to think about it in the right way. Uh, what am I going to get then for... Um, f 
for this term here. Um, right, so when we're looking at some position along the beam, I've got some loads here. The M graph. Sorry, this is so this will be my shearful graph, uh, shearful's graph, and then my bending moment graph will be uh, probably something like that. Um, the positive one, I know that that we we got sagging going on here, so we're going to get um, we've got uh, two tension values, but the y value is going to be displaced. So, so uh, because it's not, we're not dealing with a symmetric cross section. So, whatever the larger y value is, that's the possibility that that will create the maximum bending stress, positive or negative. Okay, so let's consider the other case, a bit further up to the left of the beam, where we had a negative bending moment. So in this case, the beam we would imagine is bending like this, which means that the tension is now at the top and the bending is at the bottom. Okay, so uh, I need to repeat my calculations for a lower value of M, but I'm expecting that perhaps this distance here might give me a chance to be part of the uh, the top two stresses. Well, it actually turns out no. The uh, the stresses that I'm going to get at the um, 105 location, so where the UDO is, they turn out to give the biggest stress values in terms of compression and in terms of tension. So that's not a general result, that was a specific case with the numbers that we've used and for the design of our, our I-beam. So you might want to try this in your calculator, give the video a pause. So you've been told what the depth is, sorry, the breadth. Yeah, the breadth, 20 millimeters, and the depth, 30. You've been told it's been subjected from a bending moment of one kilo newton meters, which means that m equals one uh, kilo newton meters. So we know what the m value is going to be. The y value will be just because uh, I can't see anything else happening here. I've just got regular, rect, uh, regular beam. So the uh, the y value will be half the height of the beam. So we've got that. Uh, the only thing we need to work out is the uh, this term here, the second moment of area term using the formula. So we've we've done that and we've worked it out and we've plugged in the number there. OK, so this is how maybe a typical section A type question will be framed, where we don't want to go for all the plava, working out the neutral axis, working out the second moment of error. So we just give them to you. So, so that's given to you. And we don't want you to go about working out what the shear force diagram is and the bending moment diagram. So we'll also give you the M value. So basically, given those three things, can you use the equation? So here it's asking you to calculate the stress at the bottom. So this is where my neutral axis is. I've got loading that's positive from above and I'm interested in the tensile stress at the bottom. 
So the distance from here to here is 30, so I've now got 30 millimeters. I convert that into meters, so 0 0.03. The um, bending moment value there, so we've got 5,000 newton meters. And assumably this multiplied by this gives us this value here. Um, now, what about the case where this was hogging? Okay, let's. So we imagine we've got the same value, but now we're going to imagine that it's hogging. In which case, where's the maximum tensile stress is going to occur? Well, it'll occur at the top. Okay, so no. In this case, I'm going to do exactly the same thing except replace my point. 0 0.03 we have a point zero 0.07 and then I see I get an awful lot of stress being caused at the top and that was the lecture that's gone on for a while I was falling asleep one hour <gasps>